Well, good morning, everybody. Yeah, all right. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, all right. Um, hey, my name is Caleb, and I'm teaching pastor here. And Pastor Tyler and I, we usually alternate back and forth. I got to do back-to-back this time, and that's partly because of that tropical storm. Uh, pastor Tyler is also a cross-country coach for Circle Christian, and they are in the state finals this morning. They might even be done by now, so I don't know how it went, but pretty cool, pretty cool, which means he likes to run a lot more than me. I tell you that for sure, for sure. When I think of running, I think about today's topic. Today's topic is suffering. And so uh, we're going to be looking at that. So if it's your first time that you've been back in person, um, welcome back. We're going to talk about suffering today, and it's going to be so encouraging. Here's what's going to be crazy. We're going to talk about suffering, but what we're really going to talk about is hope. You know why? Suffering isn't a surprise. We all know suffering exists. Every single human being on earth knows that suffering happens and suffering exists and suffering is a part of the human experience. But not everyone knows that there's hope. And so what we're going to talk about today is suffering, but we're going to listen to Peter who's going to write to Christians way at a different time in history than us in a totally different part of the world. But he's going to be writing to us, to our hearts as well. And he's going to be reminding us that, yeah, there's suffering. But you know what's even more important than recognizing there is suffering is realizing there is hope. So I want to pray Because in the run through of this message, I went way too long. And so what I need God to do is kind of filter it a little bit and help us not be here till too long in the day. Because the Masters is on. Just kidding. If you're a golf fan, you get it. All right. Hey, let me pray. And uh, and we'll we'll jump into the, the scriptures today. God, we just, I thank you for the worship this morning. God, even as Nate was sharing, and I could feel his heart being stirred. God, my heart is stirred today by the reality of your presence, by the reality of what you have done for us, by the reality of what you have promised to us. And God, I pray that today when we leave, if we leave with nothing else, we would leave actually believing that there is a living hope that every single one of us has access to through the work of Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that my words would get out of the way, that your words would speak, that our ears and our hearts would listen and understand and would live differently because of this time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we're in this series called Foreign Citizens. That's the title we're giving to a series on the book of 1 Peter. Five-chapter book, and we're doing more weeks than there are chapters out of this series, out of this book. And I'll tell you, if you haven't read it yet, take some time to read 1 Peter. The reason we call it Foreign Citizens is that as Peter writes in this letter, he's one of the early leaders of, Christ, of the Christian movement, and he was one of Jesus' disciples, close friends. And in this letter that he writes to Christians that are scattered throughout a region, all different kinds of cities throughout Asia Minor, ancient Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, he, he, he explains to them that to be a Christian is to be someone who is living in a place that's not really your home anymore. That even if you were born and raised in Chuliota, you've lived there your whole life, that when you become a Christian, you now go from being a permanent resident of, of Chuliota to being an exile, a foreign citizen, while you still stay in the same house. And the reason is that when you become a follower of Jesus, your eternal home now changes. The, the place your heart really looks to as home is now with God in eternal life. And... The new leader that you ultimately look to for your life isn't whoever the current government leader is of Chuliota, but it's actually who the eternal leader is of heaven. That's the you have a new leader, you have a new ultimate permanent home. And because of that, Peter tells these Christians, it changes everything about how you live in the world where you live. We talked last week about doing normal life differently, but today we're focusing on specifically the concept of suffering. And if you read through 1 Peter and the only thing you did was you took out a pen and you marked whenever Peter talked about suffering, you would find that in all five chapters, he talks about enduring through trials in this life. In every single chapter. And so we're going to read a little bit out of all the chapters, which is probably why this sermon is so long, but it won't be, I promise. But we're going to look at that today, but I want you to know this. Why does Peter need to talk to these Christians at that time about suffering? Now you're going to see, he's going to focus on a specific type of suffering. The suffering that is the result of following Jesus. Now there's going to be application to whatever suffering you're experiencing in your life. Whether that involves diagnosis or family crisis or tragedy or job loss or whatever it might be. Any suffering of your life, this is going to speak into that. But Peter's specifically going to focus on the ways in which following Jesus has made life for these people harder in some ways. 
See, about 20 years before Peter writes this letter, there was a guy named Paul with a missions team. If you ever went on a mission trip, it was a little longer than probably the trips you've been on if you went on one. And Paul went on a mission trip to this area. He wasn't from there, really. I mean, he traveled around all these different cities, he and his friends. And they had come bearing good news. And that good news was that this guy named Jesus, he had lived this life, taught these things, then died, but then resurrected from the dead. And that through this Jesus, what we just sang about could happen. Death would have no hold on me any longer. Death would lose its grip. That you could have eternal life through this man, Jesus. And this Jesus was an eternal forever king that offered life and peace and joy and hope. And if you trusted in him, you would be a part of his kingdom forever and ever. And as Paul and his friends traveled around this area that, that we, the readers live in and preached about 20 years before this letter, two things happened. One, a lot of people believed. And number two, a lot of persecution happened. We see stories, and you can read about it in Acts, where Paul is traveling around these cities, and at one point he's drug out of the city, beaten, drug out of the city, stoned, and left for dead, but then God raises him up again. Other times where he's beaten with rods, and people are thrown in jail, jail and, and they're, they're drugged before crowds of people who are chanting for them to be killed. And I mean, they are treated really badly. People lose their jobs because they're Christians. People separate from their family because they're Christians. They're kicked out of their community life because they're Christians. And so when Peter writes to them, you're going to hear him say things like, don't be surprised when you face suffering. And they're going to say, yeah, we're not. Because that's all they've experienced for 20 years. Maybe even the most strange thing, though, about Peter writing this letter. Peter talking about having courage to endure your suffering in your life. Is that when Peter had faced suffering for following Jesus as one of the disciples, he never liked it. Peter by nature was a coward when Jesus had told his disciples that I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be mistreated, insulted, I'm going to be crucified. Peter is the guy out of all the disciples who had said, no, no, Jesus. He rebuked, means he confronted Jesus. Jesus, that's not going to happen to you. And Jesus had to let him know, uh, usually if you're arguing with Jesus, you're wrong. <laughs> Just how it goes, Okay. And then when Jesus, his, his Jesus, he was following, got arrested and was being insulted and mistreated and, and was in his court hearing that Peter was a, the guy around the bonfire that denied three times that he even knew who Jesus was because he didn't want to suffer for following Jesus. Now here we are, about 30 years after that, and that same guy is going to write to people who are suffering and say, don't give up, endure in hope, have courage in the face of opposition. How can that be the same guy? But I love that it's that same guy. You know why? Because my natural human instinct is to please everyone, and I'm kind of a coward myself. I mean, I'm scared of all kinds of different animals and creatures and things. And I imagine Peter was the same way, but here's what we find. Peter shows us that having courage in the face of opposition, being able to endure through our suffering in our life, does not rely on you having a natural born courage. It simply relies on a Christ born hope. And everyone can have that. Everyone can have that. And Peter starts off the letter, and what we're going to look at over the course of this morning together is just endurance through suffering. And I know it's, it's a hard topic, but. If we ever needed it, we need it right now. And we're going to see what Peter says that's based upon. And he starts off his letter in verses 3 through 6, and here's what he says. Um, he says, All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again. We talked about that last week. When we become a Christian, we don't become a better version of us. We become a whole new creature. And as that, uh, we, that happens because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Going on. It says, now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Now let's keep going. So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. Here's what we see happen. When someone becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, we put faith in Christ. What happens is God makes us a new creature. And that new birth changes our eternal future. And because of that, the Christian throughout all history has been marked by this thing called hope. By hope. 
So here's, here's what we see. That endurance of present suffering is motivated by expectation of future joy. There's this word, this, these two words that are stamped on the New Testament. And for 2,000 years, Christians, went, their perspective on life has been marked by these two words. And now I would say, write these down, jot them in your phone, or memorize them. Eternal perspective. That the follower of Jesus Christ, for 2,000 years now, their lives are marked by eternal perspective, meaning that I look at today's circumstances through the lenses of what I know about forever. And the beautiful thing is that as a follower of Jesus, what I know about forever is that it's marked with joy and peace and life and comfort. What I know about forever is I will spend a billion, billion years in the presence of God in relationship with Him. Good is always ahead. So I endure present suffering, whether that's persecution or any other kind of suffering. And one of the things that motivates my ability to endure that is I know it's not forever. I don't know if it'll end tomorrow, but as someone who has eternal life, I know most of my life it will be a memory, not a present experience. Because I'm going to live forever in the presence of God. And I know that whatever tomorrow may hold, ultimately, good is always ahead for me because of the wonderful inheritance, the wonderful joy that is ahead for me. So I live with great expectation of future joy. And I don't know about you, but I I, I tend to have a short-range view. My timeline of life can tend to be very tight. I have a long record of my life past, but my life future, I may have goals, but when things are going badly, I don't really reach far into the future for hope. And when we lose sight of what is ahead, it's very hard to have hope in the present. And for those of us who have the gift of eternal life, What Peter says is that expectation of future joy, that is what motivates me to endure the present difficulties of my life. Now he goes on in chapter 2. I told you he's got a lot to say about enduring and suffering. So I want to hit all these things, then we'll we'll wrap up at the end with some some summaries. But he says this in chapter 2, really encouraging. For God calls you to do good, even if it means suffering. It's like, Peter, okay, I'm good with doing good, but why do you have to throw that last piece in there? God called you to do good even if it means suffering. Why do bad things happen to good people? Now, you may have a go-to answer you use for that, and don't use it right now. All right. You may have heard that question before. As a pastor, um, uh, growing up, especially as a youth pastor and working with college students, a lot of people asking questions. It's a, one of the most often quest- used questions to, to question the faith in God and, and ultimately to bring accusation against God. If God is good, why do bad things happen to good people? But I want to actually go underneath that question. You see, underneath that question, in the human instinct, there is something that we tend to think that causes us to even ask that. And it's this. If you do good, bad won't happen. If you do good, bad won't happen. There's this thing within us, our human intellect, and maybe we all assess ourselves and we're like, oh, I think I've been pretty good. Why am I experiencing this? But we think this idea that if you do good, bad won't happen. So therefore, why do bad things happen to good people? And in our culture, where, look, if you went around the world and you asked people they want to live in the United States, the vast majority of people all over the world would say yes, even in 2020. Even in 2020. Because we live in a culture of, uh, in not just the United States, but the Western world of, of Nice homes and cars and computers and and cell phones and prosperity and going to Chick-fil-A, right? I mean, we live in this culture where for the most part things go good. And it's very easy in this kind of a culture to take that phrase I use and to turn it into a Christian one. If you will trust God and do the good he calls you to, then nothing bad will happen to you. Cool. And then you open up your Bible and you're like, oh yeah, where is that verse? It's not in here. Because it's a false teaching. It's not true. In fact, let me just give you this encouragement. If you trust and follow Jesus, there's actually a very good chance that there are ways in which that will make your life harder, not easier. It sure did for the people reading this letter. There are ways in which following Jesus can make your life harder. 
It will cost you. But don't mistake me saying life is harder for not, to be not saying that it's also better. It is better, but it's harder. It's harder in some ways. But think about the context of this. And, and here, here's what it says in the longer portion there, chapter 2. He says, For God calls you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in His steps. So it doesn't just stay there. Like, do the good God calls you to do, even if it means suffering. But it continues. It says, just as this entire thing is built on somebody suffering, Jesus. So suffer just as he did, following his steps. And so here's the second thing we see. Endurance of suffering in my life. Me enduring through the difficult things. It's motivated by my expectation of future joy. And it's motivated by the example of Christ. That I look forward toward my eternal hope and I look backward to the work of the cross. And that helps me right now in my current life moment to endure through the next day. The example of Christ. What was the example of Christ? Well, Peter tells us. Literally the very next verse, here's what he says. Here's the example of Christ's suffering. He never sinned. I'm looking out. I see many people that I'm sure are in the same category. Right? Never sinned. Right? He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. That means he was completely innocent. And I'll, let me tell you something about Caleb Ives. I've gotten in trouble plenty of times when I didn't think I should. But I've never been totally innocent in my entire life. Okay? But Jesus, he never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. So what do we see there? Jesus, what's his example? Well, to a greater extent than any of us in our own lives. He suffered and he didn't deserve it. Completely innocent in every way, yet he suffered like he was the most guilty criminal on earth. And while he did that, he did not retaliate against his opposition. In fact, we have in our minds, when we think about maybe Good Friday, the image of Jesus hanging on the cross and using his very last breaths to look at the people who nailed him to the cross and tore his body apart. And he says, Father, forgive them. The innocent one. Follow that example? Pass. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> okay. I'll do something else, Lord. Um, I'll give up coffee. No, I won't. I won't give up coffee either, to be honest. You don't want to see me without coffee. But Jesus, never sent innocent sufferer, did not retaliate, but trusted it to God. Let God handle it. I mean, amazing to consider. In, in chapter 3, it points out, why was he able to do that? What motivated Jesus' endurance of suffering? Here's what it says in chapter 3, verse 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. I mean, like, it's just such a crazy concept that a perfectly innocent man suffered a completely unjust death decided he wanted to forgive the people who punished him in that way. And what motivated that? Peter says to his readers of 1 Peter, he says, you, you did. To bring you home safely to God. So when I think about the example of Christ, Peter says, what motivates me to endure my current suffering? The example of Jesus. Well, what does that look like? It doesn't matter if I'm innocently suffering. Because Jesus sure did. And I'm not going to retaliate against my enemies. I'm not going to retaliate against the person that just posted that on my wall on Facebook or whatever, right? I'm not going to retaliate. I'm going to trust that to God. I'm going to forgive those who oppose me. And what motivates me? The same thing that motivated Jesus. His mission. His mission. His mission was in mind. That's what caused him to be able to endure the cross. In fact, in Hebrews it says, For the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. But here's what it says about us in 1 Peter chapter 3, 14 through 16. It says, But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. 
Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. I'm like, wait, hold on here. Um, uh, I don't think, Peter, you understand. Don't worry or be afraid. I'm being threatened. Like that's my automatic thing I always would do. Peter says, don't. Instead of worrying or being afraid, here's what you do in the midst of your suffering. Worship God and be a witness to the world. Be a witness to the world. And what we see is that endurance of suffering is not only motivated by the expectation of future joy and the example of Christ, but our endurance of, endurance of suffering is ultimately motivated by our mission. It's motivated by our mission that the world would see and know this God that we know. Oh, I mentioned earlier this idea that hope has always been a central core character trait of the people who belong to Christ. It's been a core attribute of our character. And you may have heard before like faith, hope, and love. Maybe you got a coffee cup that says faith, hope, and love somewhere. I, I think I do. This idea like what's the Christian made of? What is our substance of our character? And it is faith, hope, and love. But you know what's weird about that? I mean, we, we may experience it. Like think about hope. You may feel hope sometimes in your life, right? You feel like you feel the reality that you have eternal life and you think about it maybe at home. But in terms of the world, those things are completely invisible. No one can see hope. No one can. Hope is this invisible thing that you have within your heart, right? People can't see hope until it becomes applied. Until hope is in action. And hope in action is endurance. Hope in action is endurance. So that this idea of us being a witness to the world, that the world would see Jesus. One of the main ways that the world sees Jesus, like it says there, and asks about what's going on with us, is when we have hope, when our natural circumstances don't seem like it would supply us with hope. Endurance is hope made visible to the world. It's hope made visible to the world. Um, this last week, or a couple weeks ago. So we have a daughter that has um, a special needs. She has a genetic disorder, and it's a really rare, uh, she's really rare design is what we say. And so we have some different unique things in our life that many, and we would even say, is a form of suffering. Sleepless nights, really difficult days sometimes, on, on completely unknown futures, all kinds of things. And, and we're a part of this, this, family, this network around the world because it's so rare of parents with similar situations all over the world, same diagnosis. And just about a week or a week and a half ago, my wife has started to do this thing on social media where she shares a little bit of the story of what we're, we walk through in our life, our own story with Smith-McGinnis syndrome. And another mom from a different state reached out to LaToya and she wanted to connect with her. And what she said was that it gives me some hope that maybe that's what's ahead for, could be ahead for us as well. Now, we don't hide the fact that sometimes we are completely broken. And what that woman is seeing is actually not Latoya's strength. Because guess what? Latoya and I, we've been huddled up in tears. We've been broken, completely discouraged. We have been completely disappointed at multiple times where we felt nothing of our own strength. What that woman sees is hope. And when she sees hope, even though she doesn't know it, what she sees is Christ. And there is something we have while our circumstances don't change that sustains us to endure it different than the world does. Like I said at the beginning, everyone on earth experiences suffering. But not everyone experiences suffering with the presence of hope. But we who have this eternal gift through the person of Jesus... It's us enduring faithfully that actually reveals to the world that they don't have to live hopeless because hope is found in Jesus. It's endurance and suffering is motivated by our mission. And, and I want to look at two quick things here before we close out, and it's this. Endurance and suffering, whether that be persecution or it's sitting in a waiting room at a hospital or it's at our house weeping as we feel like every, everyone has left us or it's walking out of a job that we just were fired from or whatever it might be, endurance and suffering, we can often feel like we do it alone. I don't know about you. When I think about like going through it really hard in my life, I often picture like myself for some reason like 
by myself, willpower, gutting it out. But the biblical model of enduring through difficult things in life is that we don't do it alone. It's a team sport. And the captain of our team is the person of Jesus. So here's what what Peter has to say in chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials. It's like, come on, Peter, why you got to throw fiery on there? Right? Don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. Peter, I don't think you understand what suffering is because you just used the word very glad in a paragraph on suffering. Or maybe he does know exactly what it's like. See, Peter says, be glad in the midst of suffering. Don't be surprised. Expect the reality that sometimes you're going to face trials. Expect that. Don't be surprised by it. Instead, be glad. Why? Because in my trials, I am partnering with Christ. I'm together with Jesus. That we endure suffering together with Christ. And I can't help but think about in that there was a, a, couple, a few other guys that were living as foreign citizens in the Old Testament. You can read about them in the book of Daniel. Really cool names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're really cool names. And they, ref- they refused to live like, in honor of the current God of the land that they were in, land of Babylon. Instead, they chose to worship God, the true God of the Bible. And, and because of that, they were living as exiles, and they end up being punished for that by being literally thrown in a fiery trial, tossed in a fiery furnace. And when they're thrown in this furnace to burn them up as punishment— If you remember the story, the king looks and says, wait a minute, didn't we throw three people in that fire? Yet there's a fourth with them who looks like an angel from heaven. And most people believe that that was literally God with them in the fiery furnace. So let me encourage you with this reality. There is absolutely a way in which suffering makes us feel like we're alone. And I don't know what your current suffering is in your life, but I know that we all have experienced something even over the course of this year, and it can make us feel alone. But let me tell you this, if you're in a waiting room by yourself with no one else in that room, you are not alone. Because just like there was a fourth one in the fire, there's a second one there with you and is the person of Jesus. That he is near to us when we suffer. And part of what helps us endure is knowing we aren't trying to endure out of our own strength, but it's alongside Jesus Christ. But that's not all that's on our team. This team sport of endurance by God's people in the world. And look what it says in chapter 5. I'll move towards the close here in just a minute. 5, 8, and 9. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. And this we're going to see. This is endurance. Part of the reason Jesus could forgive those who mistreated him is because he knew they weren't really the enemy. There was a greater enemy. And so for them, he wanted them to be forgiven because he knew there's a spiritual enemy beyond that. But let's continue on in verse 9. It says this. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. Now, Peter's writing to a world, they don't even have a globe to spin, right? They don't know I mean, they, they, nobody sailed the oceans. Like, this stuff hasn't happened yet. So their world, it's smaller than ours, but it's still big. What Peter says is, hey, if you're a Christian in Galatia, and you're currently just, you lost your job, or you're suffering, or your, your family abandoned you because you say you want to follow Jesus, and you're not pleasing them anymore, or you're sitting in a prison cell, you're not doing that alone. Christ is with you. And remember, all over the world, You have brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering right alongside you. And you're enduring with them, and they are enduring with you. You're together in this thing. You're not alone. You know what's weird? Is now we have this amazing global view of the world. We have, I mean, literally, we have like images from the skies of the earth. Right? Like we all have, I don't know if you have a globe at your house. I actually don't know if I do. But we all have these globes everywhere. And we see a world map. And we know all about this. And we have different languages. And we we engage with the whole world. But when we think of Christianity 
And I'm not attacking anyone individually more than myself. I'm saying in general, American Christians, when we think of the church, we think about the American church. And when we think about the Christian experience, we think about the American Christian experience. And because we've been sold something that's not true, which is that if you follow Jesus, you won't suffer. When I suffer, I feel like I got out of the lane and I'm alone over here suffering. While most Christians are living a really prosperous, wonderful life. But you know what? Most Christians don't live in the United States of America. To this day, the majority of Christians don't. And when God sees the church in the world, he doesn't look at the U.S. and say, oh, let's see the church. He looks at the entire earth and he sees people all over that endure suffering just like we endure suffering. And sometimes in different ways. He sees people in prison cells in Asia or in Iran. He sees people who, who've lost their families in Africa or churches were burned to the ground. He sees that. And one of the things that can help us to endure our own trials and sufferings faithfully is to get a wider view of this world than just our narrow view of the American church. In 2020, it's 250 million Christians live in nations where the, the rate of, of persecution is very high, high to extreme risk of being persecuted for believing in Jesus Christ. And that's part of our family, part of our family. And so as we zoom out and we think of Christ with me and me with this global family that's been going for 2,000 years, my current endurance is not me alone. It's me being a part of this family of people all over the world that have endured through difficult things with hope so that the watching world could see that there is a way to live with hope. Now, I want to show a quick video. It's just two minutes long. And I saw this a, a couple of years ago. It's from just a few years back. And it's a video of a news. There's a news anchor. It's on Egyptian TV. So it's not in English. All right. Egyptian TV. And they're interviewing a, a woman and her sons are sitting next to her. And this woman is a Christian, and her husband has just recently been martyred, been killed for being a Christian. And they're interviewing them. What I want you to know, the news anchor, he's not a Christian. He's not a Christian. But he's going to hear something from this woman. And I want you to think about, when you think about your church, I want to invite us to think about them as part of our church, part of our Christian family in the earth, that are enduring faithfully and trusting in Jesus. So let's watch this quick video and then we'll close out our time today. مرحبا بي ومبسوطه ومش زعلانه من اللي عمل كده بقول له ربنا يسامحك انت مغيب يا ابني انت مغيب صدقني مغيب ومش زعلانه بس انا بطلب من ربنا يعني اللي هو خلاص انتهى وراح بطلب من ربنا ان يعني يسامحهم ويحاولوا يفكروا شويه يفكروا يفكروا صدقيني لان هم لو فكروا احنا ما بنعملهمش اي حاجه صدقيني ما بنعملهمش حاجه لهم فكروا تاني فكروا ان انتوا بتعملوه ده صح ولا غلط وربنا يسامحكم واحنا مسامحينكم بامانه بقولها مسامحينكم وصدقيني لان انتوا حطيتوا لي ابو ولادي في مكان ما كنتش اتمنى العمر كله صدقيني بامانه يعني انا عمري انا بفتخر بيه وبتمنى اكون انا جنبه صدقيني يا بنتي واشكرك يا حبيبتي أقباط مصر مصنوعين من فولاذ أقباط مصر مئات السنين بيتحملوا كوارث ومصايب كتيرة القبط المصري يعشق تراب بلده القبط المصري يتحمل كل شيء عشان وطنه وإيه كمية التسامح اللي عندكوا دي لو أعداءكو يعرفوا قد ايه انتوا متسامحين بجد ما كانش حد يصدق ده انا لو ابويا والله ما اقول كده ابدا الناس دي عندها كميه تسامح عن حق عن عقيده دول بني ادمين والله مصنوعين من ماده تانية الله يرحمه عم نسيم بطل وشهيد ومثل و و و و و اعلى 
للي قاعد كل واحد في البلد دي يقول لك هي البلد دي ايه والبلد دي ماشيه ازاي البلد دي ماشيه كده بلد دي ماشية بالصبر بالجلد بالتحمل بالست العظيمة دي بالعيال اللي خلف ما ماتش ضرباهم وعمل رجالة رجالة When I saw that I, it was part of for me a, a, a journey of widening my view of what I'm a part of See Christianity was never something that was built for the mountaintops and the beach vacations Christianity is a sturdy thing. It's built for the valleys of suffering that every single person walks through. And if we want to follow Jesus, it will go through the valley of suffering. We will not avoid it. And that maybe that we experience persecution in our life in a way we haven't before. It may be that we experience, regardless of what it might look like, we will experience difficult things. And if 2020 has done anything for us, it's given everybody the chance to experience difficult things. To experience difficulty. And a hopeless world desperately needs to see that those who have literally eternal life are not hopeless. And when the world looks at the church, I want them to see something like that in me. I want the world to look at Caleb and say, he's of a different substance. Not just because he's memorized some good Bible verses, not just because he knows some good songs or listens to 88.3, but he's just made of something different because when he faces difficulty in life, he just endures it differently. We're going to go into a song of worship, and as we do, I want to just leave us to consider a couple of thoughts this week. I want us to consider this. Number one, do you have eternal perspective? Like when you think about your present day, how much does it, do you see it through the lens of your eternal future? And here's the reality. We, here's what we know. It's going to be okay. Amen. I don't know when it's going to be okay, but it's going to be okay. Amen. Do you have eternal perspective? If not, find ways to remind your heart of it throughout the week. Secondly, in what ways are you maybe, or am I maybe choosing comfortable disobedience to Christ instead of the uncomfortable obedience to him. And if so, I'm challenging myself and inviting us, let's join with people like our sister in Egypt and say, you know what? Though it may cost me, may I choose to trust in Christ. There's a verse I want to close us with today in 419. Here's what Peter says. He says, so if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, Keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you for he will never fail you. Though, though endurance and suffering is motivated by all these things we've talked about today, ultimately it comes down to trusting in God. That the God who created all things has created me and has promised me an eternal future. So God, I don't know what tomorrow might hold. But what I do know is that tomorrow will hold the same God that today is held by. A God you don't change. And if you don't change, though the storm may rage and things may break into complete chaos, my soul will be still because I trust you. We're going to sing this song, It Is Well With My Soul. And, and as we do, I just want to say the world needs to see lives that don't just sing it on a Sunday, but lives that sing out through the way we live that no matter what is going on in our lives, our soul is well because our soul is secure in the one who loves us and holds it all together. Let's pray. God, we love you. We need you. God, we need your help. And today is not a light subject. There's just no way to try to make it funny or fun or easy. But God, yet it is so important for us to know that God, I don't know what everybody came in here with. I am sure that there are people who wipe tears from their eyes driving here this morning. And I am sure that there are people who laid in bed last night scared about what's ahead for them. And so God, if nothing else, would you flood this room with the reality of hope that we have in you? And God, would you challenge us and call us to live in such a way that the watching world would say, where did you come from? And how come 
you still have hope in the midst of all of this. Because Lord, what this world needs is you. And what we need is you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name.